Mike. <laughs> what do they call it? Camera action? That's, camera action. That's what is happening. Right? Okay, so good evening again. Let's try this one more time. <clears throat> so we're going to do OOP review, object oriented programming. And uh, the thing here is that we are going to focus on um, the rudimentary stuff writing a class, creating an object. So we'll go through all of that. And then I'm going to introduce one new thing today, which is containment. So once you know containment, then we're going to get into the design for assignment three. Okay? And I want to design the assignment three with you guys in class. So that way you can, you have the basis for going out and uh, working on. So. so so I had a question from someone earlier today about another resource. I mean, I thought my lectures are the best source, right, for learning stuff. And then, then the book is there, and the book does something uh, because every uh, author has a different perspective. And so if you need a third perspective and you need uh, another resource, so I did look it up. And this is one I do recommend, uh, Thinking in Java by Bruce Eckel. And you can go to uh, bruceeckel.com and you can look at this text. And borrow one from the library. I think you can probably download an older edition in PDF format as well. This is a really good read, right? We, we all have our own spin on how we describe things. And then there is also uh, the perception of the subject matter. So if you need a third perspective, there it is, right? You've got mine, you've got the book, and you've got this other book. And then, of course, you have Google and good luck with that. Uh, thinking in Java, I mean, this guy does, uh, he, he talks through the subject matter really well. And I think you'll enjoy it. So, I look at objects uh, in real world, in your physical world, and I tend to uh, draw analogies from there to help you understand these concepts, right? So I could pull up the slide deck, but I'm not gonna do that. There is a nice slide deck that walks you through the anatomy of a class, and it takes about 25 slides which I guess would be a lot of slides to look at. Uh, so I want to do this quickly. So you all know what a class is. If you are creating a class, it should always be public. It's global, right? A class will have instance variables. Uh, and static variables. Static variables, and what is the difference between these two? These are unique for each object. So like the assignment two, part one, where you're creating a data object or person object, you know, you, you track, you declare the name, that name is unique for each person. So that would be a good instance variable. There are very few things in life that are static. Everything is an instance, right? Even like, you know, one could assume that the temperature in the room is static because it's shared, right? There is, uh, this is my definition of static. Of course, I wouldn't, say that to anybody. Why? Because I'll explain it in detail. Because if I said static is shared one copy loaded first, then it probably won't mean a thing to anybody. But I guess it means something to you guys. Shared between instances of a class. Uh, one copy means one um, memory area is allocated for it. When the value changes, it changes for uh, all the instances. Load it first because 
it is something that is uh, uh, the memory for a static variable is set when the class loads at the very beginning of the class load. Then we have something called a constructor. And constructor is a method to initialize an object with, with some values. So you have default constructors and overloaded. Need I go over the details of you want me to cover the details of default and overloaded? Are you guys okay? okay. So with uh, default, uh, is the default constructor still available when you write overloaded constructors? No. no. You need to specify. You need to, the good habit is to always specify one. Yes. Uh, is it good Java convention to just write a, uh, even if you're not going to overload the constructor, just to put a null construct, uh, a yes. no X constructor? It's always a good idea to create a default constructor with no lines of code. That's a, that's a good coding convention. It should always be that. And then you have instance methods and static methods. We have instance methods and static methods. And usually, uh, instance methods modify instance variable, variable values. And static methods modify static variables. So here's the exam question. Can a Static variable modify the value of an instance variable? Why not? Why not? A static variable cannot modify the values of an instance variable. Static methods. Static variables are shared, static methods are also shared. But static methods can be called before an object is ever created. You see, so if you have an instance variable, right, and you, instance variable is not even, the object is not even created. And if you try and modify that variable value uh, using a static method, before the object is even created, it's going to throw a runtime exception. So generally we don't do that, but the other way around is fine. Instance variables can modify static variables, or uh, yeah, so that, that, that is doable. Um, why can't, um, uh, let's say if you want, why can't the uh, compiler know to create an object first and then run any um, static methods that might affect any instance variables? Good question. What should the object look like? The object, well, it should just be based on the class. With maybe. default <coughs> values? Yeah, like maybe like if there's any, if there's any use of static methods, then the, the, if they, they, let's say the static methods return like an integer or something, they can just initialize it at zero, and then yeah. rerun the static methods based on, can, and I'm just curious why they couldn't do something like that. There is a, uh, assumption about how the object should look like and so that's why uh, no assumptions are made so they just disallow so that's why we use this one-to-one -one correlation but reading a value of a static variable in an instance method is okay All right. So, you understand the concept of association?
passing an object by reference to a method. Associations are generally temporary. Associations are generally temporary. Like I'm sitting on this chair, human object on a chair, temporary association. Meeting in the classroom, temporary association. Okay? What I would suggest you guys try and do is uh, perhaps code one or two of these uh, physical world associations uh, in Java. Just to get some experience. Define the class, define the method that will create the association, pass one object by reference to the method, and change the values. Any questions on association? I guess this will come to life when you implement it. I think it's all about uh, practice. We can talk about this all day, it doesn't matter. It's when you start implementing it is when you know things go wrong and you say, okay, what's the question? And then you answer the question and you get it. What about encapsulation? Encapsulation is making uh, private properties. Not public. Properties are made private. This is more for access control of instance and static variables. And it's both get and set. Right? It's both get and set methods. Obviously, you are getting uh, used to uh, working with. Uh, uh, Eclipse features for generating these automatically. So, all the details aside that we just talked about, I have some sample programs that I'd like to share with you. I'm just downloading these from the You can download these and uh, what we will do is create a new project and uh, Java props. file system. This is something you can use for, um, you know, your, if you are working on a project at home and want to bring it to the lab, you know, all that kind of Downloads folder, I have frogs one through six and box and cat. And I want to bring it into this folder. Hopefully, that should have done it. 
and there we are. Okay? So we're going to look at program one dot Java. Ready? Just some simple coding example. In fact, you guys can tell me what this program has. If anything. Uh, there's a default constructor. What kind of a method is this? Instance method. And so we instantiate program one and call the instance method. Is that are there any instance variables in this program? Program one. Program one is an instance variable. It's the name of the class. P is a local variable. Anything you put in main, right, would be a local variable. So instance variables will generally go in the class body, not in the body of the main. So we have no instance variable. All right, let's go to the next one. We've looked at something like this with strings, right? We are, instead of creating a string object, we are creating an integer object. These are wrapper classes, similar to declaring an int, right? Right. These are, like, v1 and v2 are integer objects, both using the same value. And look at line 8. Line 8 compares object references. Line 9 compares object values when you use the equals method. So you might, uh, you, you might re recall the uh, string, string buffer e you know, discussion and we talked about the equals method at that time. Yeah? Program three, nothing interesting, same old stuff. You know the difference between string literals and string objects, right? So one good question that could come out in the test is if I have two string literals and I compare, like if S1 and S2 are just double quote A, I'll be comparing values at that time, right? You remember that? Mm -hmm. Two and three almost look the same, but they're not. There is something new. If you want to take command line arguments, we're going to try and make sense of this guy right now, string args. <coughs> So, there is a way when you run the program to provide a bunch of strings with launching the program. And if you end up providing two or three or four parameters, uh, when basically what happens is a, an array of strings is created. An array of strings is created. And we can take a look at that and print out the values. So this is a way of getting input. So one way to really visualize this, and I'll just go in command line mode just to just to show you guys this. So 
So I'm just going to set the path to the bin directory of <coughs> JDK just so I can compile programs in uh, command shell. So now I have Java C, right? So what I'll do is take program five and create that in a text file. So basically what I've done is taken that code into a new file and this is something I guess you, you guys will most likely not end up using because you, you tend to use Eclipse a lot. So you can see I just created that program. So using Java C I compile and I can run program file. So as you can see, you can you can you can review the output very quickly from the code up code up above, right? It's looking for arch dot length to be more than two, and the reason it's not it's because I haven't provided the values. So when I one moment please. Uh, when I type uh, 1 and 2 after program 5, right, it ignores these first two because <coughs> Java is the runtime is invoking the Java virtual machine. Program 5 is the name of the class and I don't have to say dot class here and then I start providing these uh, values and these can be strings. These are, these are all interpreted as a string and so it prints out those values. So just to just to make a point that if I wanted to get a string with multiple, um, uh, you know, separated by a space, multiple strings separated by a space, you know, when you put that in double quotes, it will take that as one string. Okay, your question. Um. What is, what is args? Args is, uh, it refers to command line arguments. It's a string array. I could, I could uh, name this as, it doesn't have to be args, it can be a. And then I'll use, is this the name of the array? Oh, okay. Right, but we don't say new string five or new string three. JVM takes care of that based on what? <laughs> Bless you. Based on the values that are passed here. If I pass in, if I pass five strings, then that array size will be five and so on. Make sense? Okay, so It'll be fun to uh, look at the next one. Program six. And now we talk about a third kind of relationship, contain. Water, I mean, or you could say cup contains water. That's containment. It's empty now, but so when an object is instantiated as an instance variable in another object, right? So like uh, brain in human, that's contained, right? Um, battery in iPhone, because 
you cannot take the battery out. I think we talked about that before. Kind of an old joke. Not laughable. So how is this implemented, right? So I will create a class, a public class iPhone. And I guess this is where we, because iPhone, actually no, let's call it phone. Because iPhone will be an instance of phone, right? I will say private battery B1 which means a battery class has to be created separately and it will have a private variable called charge And battery has a default constructor and whenever you instantiate a battery, it will be 100% charge. And since charge is an integer, when When the battery loses charge, it will lose by 1% every time. And that's enough behavior on battery for now. Right? Does that all make sense? Anything like unclear about the battery? So, so now we have our default constructor for the phone and for the phone to work, it should always be shipped with a battery like iPhone. Though. Unless you buy a used one from Amazon it might have a missing battery. You buy the phone for five bucks and battery for a hundred. <laughs> Batteries are expensive. Ask the Tesla guys. So, I can also pass in a battery in the constructor and I can say, okay, let's take that battery and use it. Overloaded constructor. Right? And now I'll go ahead and power up the phone. If uh, B1 is not equal to null, right, then I can power up the cell phone. So I can probably have Boolean power up. And what will the Boolean be set to by the default constructor? False. False. So whenever a iPhone is, or whenever a phone is created, it's going to be powered up, right? So now I power up and I'll say what? Power up is equal to true, right? And what else? You know, the battery will charge on power up. No? This one though. Whether you like it or not. 
So we'll end up calling, it, it has to lose some charge, come on. Hmm? You'd probably say negligible, but you know, we call the losing charge method. Right? So you see how this thing is working? The battery is completely contained in the phone. Whether I pass it from the outside or instantiate it inside. This, this is also called an association. It's called a strong association. I also use the word containment for it. When an object is completely a property of another object, it's contained. Yes? Um, is power up, is that charge? So is that charging the phone or is it turning the phone on? What power is up is on? just tracking if the phone is on or off. Oh, okay. So, so that's why it's losing charge. Got it. Correct. So we just even name it just void on as phone is on. Yeah. So if B1 is not null, and maybe I should check if the phone is, see if the power up is already true, I don't want to go through this process. So I should already, I should, I should put a check in place in my phone what? That if power up and power up is not equal to true. And you know about Java conditions, right? You have to use these parentheses too much. So if the phone ain't powered up and there is a battery in the phone, then it can power up. And similarly, I can write uh, another method and say, uh, turn the phone off. But the thing is, on the phones, there is only one button for power up and power down. So, so I'll need to change this code if I want to turn the phone off. So I just say if the battery is not equal to null, right? So if that is true, then I have a nested if. Get rid of this um, and operator. Now if there is a battery and the phone is powered up, uh, if the phone is not powered up, then I'll power it up. Else? Else I'll power it down. <laughs> and can we make, we can make our phone gain charge. So you see now I have programmed the one power button to power on and power off. Yes? Making sense? Um, on our first constructor, why is B1 equal to a new phone and not a new battery? Uh, I think that's a uh, lack of coffee. So it's supposed to be a new battery? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Good catch. I could say I was checking to see if you're awake, but <laughs> won't really work here. So now, for this example to work, so somewhere in main, we will instantiate a uh, we will instantiate a battery. And 
we will instantiate uh, a phone. And I can give it the Duracell, although that is an oxymoron. Who knows, iPhone can use a Duracell branded battery. You'll never know, iPhone users, because you cannot see the battery. <laughs> If we were actually doing this, would we put main in a, would this be in a driver? Yeah, I would create a driver class and put it in a, yeah. And then does that mean that our battery and phone classes would not have a main? Right. Okay. A class is not required to have a main. So this demonstrates containment. When, uh, I mean, you can obviously program methods forever, but the key point is declaring an object and instantiating it all in the same one class. Okay? Continue. So I think you have another example waiting for you. So we have box. Program 6 has a box. So program 6 is demonstrating usage of a box. And it just has get box. So we create a new program. And look at this code, you know. New program 6, new box treasure. Because the constructor of program 6 is looking for a box. Right? So we instantiate the box. Okay, what is the box? I don't know. Let's look at it. Box has a box name. Right? And get and set name. So P contains a box with a name and we are printing the name. Program 6 has a box. It's a simpler example, but the same thing as uh, iPhone and, I'm sorry, phone and battery. I'm not sure why I'm stuck. Time to go by one. Okay? Containment, yes. Can we run it? This one? Yeah. Okay, that's dangerous. Uh, of course we can run it. Okay, run as Java. Selection does not contain a main. Why not? So since I did an import, it's not part of a project. So what I need to do is do you remember the command line? Just change the directory to this. Yeah, I could do that, but. Uh, well, let's set it up in Eclipse. Yeah. I'm not, uh, we'll do it both ways. No problem. So maybe I can just pull this in the source folder and put the box in the source folder and it'll go in the default package and now I can run it. If I can do that, that was like the easiest way. And there you go. So the, the box. Um, it contains a box with name treasure. So p dot get box and get name. That's in the box. So p is uh, program six. Yeah. Get box is the method here mm -hmm. that returns a box. It returns a reference of a box. And then inside the box, there is a get name. Right? So we write long sentences by nesting the method calls like that. I could have done the same thing 
in multiple lines just to demonstrate I could have said p dot get box and that returns a box. So I could say box a1 equals that semicolon. And then I can say a1 dot get name semicolon. And that's like a string. Oops. And then I could have just printed it out. So that get box dot get name translates to these two lines of code. So your call. Uh, these shortcuts are pretty nice because you can do a lot in and you also save memory quite frankly because you're not creating all these variables you're creating temporary objects and those temporary objects get garbage collected so containment are we covering a few new things today or been there done that Let's take a 10 and then we'll design the, the next assignment. Great.